It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, the human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. I'm kind of blown away by your messages. Thank you. I love every single message and I would like to streamline a way to get them. So if you go to mustamplify.com slash POE, on the right hand side in the middle of the page, you will see a red button that reads, send us an audio message. You can record the message from your phone, from your computer or your iPad or tablet uh, or whatever device you use. I would love to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. Last week, we gave you an unabridged teaser of a deep conversation with the amazing Kelsey Ramsden. We speak about death, community, and deep friendships. You can tell how much she puts into things she does because we cried a few times. And what about her passion? She is so passionate in everything she does, if it's living life or having a conversation with a friend. And I'm not sure how we have suddenly become okay with believing that if you can't build a business on your passion, you don't build a business at all, as Kelsey explains. Like, again, not to be PC but, uh, or, or to be anti-PC, I think, I think passion came about in this very, like, uh, everyone can follow their dream and bliss idea archetype which is cool and I hope that people do, but what that's lacking is uh, common sense. And so you may be a passionate yogi who, you know, your life's work is um, the practice of yoga, but you happen to not be a business person. So good luck. You're just about to fuck up your passion because you're going to put all of your heart and soul in that thing and arrive at a place, potentially you're broke, you know, like, so I think- And you'd probably hate it after a while. Oh yeah, you do a hundred percent. And how does that be a passion if you're willing to let it go when it's hard? Like, is that passion? Yeah, I mean, that's the, I think that's the tough point for a lot of people is they follow their passion, they wind up in a tough spot. They can't let it go because it is their baby. Um, but, you know, that enters a whole nother conversation about how we define ourselves. And where that's a tough place to let go is where our ego um, is so attached to what we do and not who we are. This reminded me about Dr. Sherry Walling talking about that study done with brain scans of entrepreneurs in volume two when she said. Like the bottom line is entrepreneurs really don't perceive their company as separate from themselves, but they They perceive it as an extension of themselves, one that they're highly biased toward. They're attached to. Um, So, yeah, it's hard for me to, like, take seriously anybody who's like, oh, yeah, I I feel very nonchalant about my company or, like, very objective. It's like, no, you probably don't. I mean, you could be exceptional, but probably not. So I suppose it is likely that we also avoid monetizing our passion because what if I ruin it? Like... What if I ruin loving what I do? And I suppose it can be the other way around, right? It can be that if we just love what we do, irrespective, then we don't really have a problem, right? Love your activity, man, Mm. right? I don't care what you do, Mm. right? I always say, do what you do for charity, love what you do, be passionate about what you do. And what makes you an entrepreneur, if you're able to do that and monetize it, because profitability comes first. Then if you can derive a purpose that has a social impact or helps other people, Passion is simple, but I'm tired of people telling me, oh, you know, I I love football. I love sports. Come on, let's be serious. What percentage of people on earth don't love one sport? That was David Meltzer in volume five. Monetizing your passion seems like something that could screw with minds of entrepreneurs, for sure. Then I started to think about artists and athletes and painters and certain types of tailors and lawyers and of course business owners and founders 
The ones that are successful are the ones that love what they do and get paid to do it. But in all that, there is the enjoyment of the activity, right? Even when you're lifting heavy and training hard, you are enjoying the training if it is truly your passion. And Kelsey started to explain the idea of playing with your passion in Addendum 1. Let's say I'm an exceptional physicist and I study my thing and I'm doing my thing and I'm, you know, I'm just so focused on cracking the next big idea. But the challenge is all the big ideas come from like uh, this like impregnation of other ideas from other scopes and varieties and also from this notion of like openness and mental play. But the further along we get in our like adult neurotic ego. We think we presuppose the outcome. We say, that's going to be the solution. I'm going to find a way to support it. And we don't go about it in this really playful way just to see what happens. You watch children play and they don't know the storyline or whatever. They're just down on their knees. Things are coming up. They're working with what they've got and they're incorporating new and creative insights from everything. It's all, you know, everything's glorious. And so. And here's the deal. Kelsey actually does an even better job explaining this in her TEDx talk. So today I'm going to talk about why play is the new PhD of the future. I'm going to start by telling you a little story. So this picture is actually a a life-changing masterpiece. Um, There's three things about this picture. One, it's totally mundane. The second is it's totally tragic. And the third is totally transcendent. Does anyone notice anything unique about this picture? Just a throw of hand, like something? Two sons. Good. So, two sons. Mundane picture drawn by a six-year-old kid. The tragic part is that the person in charge of the six-year-old kid at this period of time said that picture is wrong. You have to redraw that. No good. There are two sons. The six-year-old kid said, piss off. I recognize, clearly I'm six, I get there's not two sons. I'm just like kind of having the concept here that that would look neat if there were. So why is it then that the education everyone received in this room and the one that our children are receiving today are in essence all the same thing that Sir Ken Robinson talked about, right? They're, it's, it's a system set up for check marks, basically, hoop jumping, I I have some fancy pieces of paper, and I'm not ashamed of them, Um, but I will say they're just kind of for smart monkeys, right? So I jump hoops well is kind of all I can tell you about those fancy pieces of paper. I suppose the reason I wanted you to listen to all this is so that you truly understood the parts we were missing out on purely on this weird notion that we control everything or can control everything. And that we have to have a plan. And if that plan doesn't go according to the way we think it should, then we have to panic and stress and beat ourselves up about it. I never really knew how I spoke to myself until one day my wife Rochelle said, did you mean to say that out loud? Even then, I didn't really understand how badly I spoke to myself, especially because I had been doing it like that for so long. And then one day Rochelle said, firstly, I don't like you talking to yourself the way you do. But more importantly, I don't like that you've started to talk to me in that same manner. Yep. Yeah, I um, fixed that pretty quick. Actually, that's not true. I still struggle with that and I have to be aware of my automatic reactions. So I catch myself before it comes out. Sometimes if I'm tired and I haven't eaten, that voice comes out. And I have to apologize for it, even if it is to myself. For me, that is massive success. Enough about my success. This is the author of the book, Success Hangover. And I wonder what Kelsey remembers when she thinks of her successes. I think... Uh, having three children that I think will be decent human beings is up there. I think parents, you know, that's a natural response. Um, when I was at MBA school, I was nominated for valedictorian, which was a total 
it was a total overthrow. Like people were freaking out because I didn't have good grades. They're like, what is she doing on the list? What if she gets it? And uh, what's she going to say in the speech? And she's going to ruin everything. My parents are going to be there. Um, and, uh, and so I did not get valedictorian. Um, but in the final moments, so, so you find out like a week before, I didn't get it. And I was kind of disappointed because that would have been a great status thing. Would have made my parents happy. It would have made me feel like I was important and useful and valuable. And it would have proved all those people wrong who thought I was like a weird hippie. And, um, but the day of the convocation, I win this award. It's called the MBAA Contribution Award. And it's the only award voted on by everyone in the class. And it's for the person who contributed the most to your experience. Wow. And that, I, I would have taken that, like, valedictory thing and, like, torn it up and put it on the ground and peed on it. Mm. You know, to win this other award, which to me was so much more because... Um, I think all of us, when we, when we check these boxes about, about successful things we want to define ourselves by, when, when it's given or gifted to you by virtue of your efforts and who you are and how you showed up, and it's done by your colleagues who you respect, that's a whole other thing altogether, you know? And so I think, I think of all the things I've done, those two really... Uh, are examples of my contribution to a cause. And so I think that recognition is probably the most meaningful. I mean, I think it's, it's easy when my ego was bigger and really in charge. Uh, I had grandiose plans and expectations. And, um, and it was a beast. You know, it was really, a, 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 it ate my soul a bit. And, uh, and, that, and that's why I think cancer was the greatest gift because it just punched me in the face. I was like, hey, guess what? An online poll conducted by YouGov in 2018 found that in the past year, 74% of the 4,500 people surveyed had felt so stressed that they had been overwhelmed or unable to cope. More about Kelsey and cancer later in the show. So Kelsey is really interesting in the way she separates herself from her ego. And it is clear that she isn't in the pursuit of success. So why does success keep finding her? Great question. That was my question. What the hell keeps happening? Um, Yeah, look, so I'm not particularly smart. Uh, I didn't like jump the hoops very well. I'm decent at math. Um, So when you say smart, you're talking about school? Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, for me, going through the, the traditional tra- trajectory, there were a lot of things I wasn't. And, and that's what I focused on. So I'm not particularly that pretty. It was like the friend character in the movie, um, you know, didn't get straight A's, blah, 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 blah. I know, and on and on it went. But I was always good at making friends and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so I'd arrive at these places where I, I perform poorly uh, but somehow wind up at the top. So I was the lowest GPA into my MBA program, but then I'm nominated for valedictorian and win this award. I'm like the, you know, I'm the, I'm totally the underdog makes good person. And it just keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. And so then at, cer- at a certain point, I'm forced to go, okay, so if my belief of self is basically like shitty, there's no one who beats themselves up. Like, I mean, we all do it, but I, I am like a world-class asshole. I don't know. I mean, I pretty, I'm pretty sure I was always kicking my ass. I was always just being such a jerk to myself. I was always just being such a jerk to myself. Ah, I'm not the only one. Misery does like company. The feeling of not being alone is an insane one. Sorry. Back to Kelsey. But when there's such a stark contrast between external reality, right, with the feedback of the world and your self-belief, at, at a certain point, I was forced to say, okay, if I'm so not smart, not good, not enough, not, 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 but yet I'm on the cover of all these magazines, I'm winning all these awards, people want to talk to me, like, what the hell, man? So I just started investigating 
and started reading and all these like magazines and, and, and articles and people who study the mind. And the question I would get most often is, how do you think that way? So I'd have a solution and say, how do you think like that? How did you think of that? And I never had a good answer. So that's what I set out to figure out is how do I think like that? And um, my first attempt at it was like this little TEDx talk I did. It was called Play as a New PhD. And it was about a theory that I had that um, really, it's not, it's not what you know, it's how you think. Um, you can Google anything, uh, but it's the way that you process information that differentiates, you know, the average from the exceptional. And so I started going down that rabbit hole. I was like, how do I process information? What is it that's different about when I wire up my mind and stuff gets spit out at me? Um, and so that really informed a lot of the stuff that wound up uh, in the book yeah. because it was like a grand collision of um, extreme lack of self-worth, uh, extreme success, and uh, kind of this cliff moment of what's next and having to reframe what is success to me? Who the hell am I after all? And what is it that I do better than anyone else? And how do I apply that? Self-worth. It is no lie that I am on the journey of appreciating my own worthiness. Sometimes when we start this journey, we start by saying, I want to be this person or that person. But do we? Do we really want to be those people? I think that looking at someone and saying, I want to be like... Gary V. I want to be like blah, 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 blah. Look, you don't know Gary V. No one but Gary V. actually knows Gary V. And that's a fact. Um, and so trying to model yourself when you are not that person after some of... Now you can say, I'd like to, um, as opposed to be like him, take on activities he does. I want to wake up at five in the morning. I want to have engaging conversations. I want to, you know help people, whatever it is you want to do, but you have to do it the way that you do it. And I think that so many people, and this like breaks my heart. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, I just, this whole self-help thing around and, and this, these micro bubbles that people are in these echo chambers of not being enough in this and, and be like me, jazz hand stuff. And if you only, you know, I think is causing a lot of really great humans with a lot of potential to go down paths that are not theirs, uh, trying to be like another person. And I'd like to introduce to everyone this idea that competencies are fluid. You're developing new ones all of the time if you actively choose to. And so to your point around, you know, this, these kind of people who are following other people and doing what they do, um, you never will get there until you take your own competencies, figure out what you're working with and start to exercise that shit, mask some stuff up, try it out, give it a roll. You may or it may or may not work, but in that you develop a new competence. What do you mean by competency? I asked people to stand up and then those who rode their bike perfectly well, the first time they got on a bike can sit down. Zero people sit down. But somehow between the time we learned to ride a bike, which is, you know, uh, a competency we didn't have. Yeah. Uh, and today, adulthood, we create this complex in our minds like we are ultra human and have super capacity to nail things on the first try that are complicated and difficult and a shit ton more difficult than riding a bicycle. Yeah. What is that? You know, and I think this idea of play should get injected right there. That if we could approach a thing, like just if we could get ourselves and our ego behind us enough to be okay to give a thing a go and not presuppose an outcome and not reflect forward I think people would go about their lives a great deal differently. Yeah, wouldn't we just? Rochelle and I were talking about how it is so difficult for her parents to enjoy time doing nothing. I've mentioned how I feel guilty if I'm not doing stuff. I'm getting better, 
because I'm practicing. Practice creates muscle memory. But no one wants to practice. That's why we want to be like someone and not do the things that that person does to be themselves. We just want the muscle memory. So there is mastery of the muscle memory, the movements, the, you know, the perfect strike on a ball. But then you take that into a game. And what's thrilling is the fact that you can use that muscle memory in an ever-changing, never-repeatable situation. That's what fires you up. It's not the strike on the ball. It's that your mind is 100% present. It is tuned right in and turned right on because of the fact that this may never happen again and you have one chance. And that is what gets us off. This is, again, that difference between these grandiose, huge, ultimate moments and the micro moments. And um, it's a muscle that we develop to be able to handle the micro moments over and over and over again so that when we get to the big moment, we don't choke. So what we do is we hurdle ourselves at the big moment without practicing every day micro moments of discomfort and, and, and never again in this. So it's no surprise that we choke. It's like, it's like going on stage having never rehearsed. Ah, practicing every day. As much as I knew the answer, I didn't like hearing it. When we come back, Kelsey does a bit of mind reading on us all. of this audio documentary is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values in a place where conversations can be had without judgment. A place where our listeners can give us constructive feedback to improve the show with topic and guest recommendations. For access to this space, go to mustamplify.com slash POE and click the button. Before the break, we covered passion, confidence, and practice. Now, Kelsey shows us how much we are alike. So if I could, um, is it cool if I walk people through an example of how they can do that? Yeah. Yeah, cool. And is it cool if we do like a bit, little bit of mind reading? Okay, so I'm going to ask, and you can play, everyone plays along. Um, I'm going to ask two questions. Yeah. You're going to answer it in your head. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to read your mind. Okay. Cool. So, uh, the first one I want you, and this is just like the first thing that comes to mind. Don't, don't get too heady about it. Yeah. Okay. I want you to think of, um, something, you know, really well, something specific that you know, really well. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Now I want you to think of a memory, something you remember specific memory. Just a specific memory, something you remember. Got it? Mm. Cool. Okay, so here's what I know. So this works 93% of cases in the first one, 97 mm. in the second. Mm. So 93% of the time, the thing that you know really well could be taught. Could you teach it to another human? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, and, and most often, that's actually something you define yourself as. I'm an accountant, mm. whatever. So the second thing, uh, the memory, it has three tags to it. Uh, Emotion, so love, lust, fear, hate, something that you really need. Yeah. yeah. Cool. The second thing is it was something that couldn't be repeated the exact same way twice. Yeah. Yeah. And the third thing is you did it with another human being by virtue of either you were there with them or you mm. shared it with them afterwards. You told them mm. the story eye to eye. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's do it. Let's spread <laughs> everyone's mind. So amazing. <laughs> Parlor tricks. When I thought of something I knew really well, I thought of cooking, to be honest with you. I wish I thought of being a good speaker or a good podcaster. But now when I think about it, I'm a really good interviewer. Anyway, when Kelsey asked the second question. Now I want you to think of a memory, something you remember, specific memory. Got it? 
I thought about the first time I married Rochelle and the minister asking me to take my vows. Definitely had emotion. Couldn't be repeated twice the exact same way because I called her my awfully wedded wife in front of everyone as a joke. And the fact we're still married is uh, because she didn't hit me that day. And I did it with another human being, which was obviously Rochelle. I'd love to know what you answer to those questions. You can leave me a voicemail or a voice message at mustamplify.com slash POE. I always thought that everyone but me had their shit together for like the longest time. The 2018 online poll conducted by YouGov also found that 49% of young adults who had experienced high levels of stress felt that comparing themselves to others was a source of stress. I want to take a moment to make a declaration that I, I halfway through the book, I, I wrote, and again, people are like, that's insane, don't do that, that's going to ruin everything. But I stuck with it because um, no one is a knower. There are zero people who have their shit together 100%. Me writing the book halfway through, I said, look, this is, this is an idea. This is my experience. This is how far I've taken it. There's more to come. You know, there is, there's a greater conversation to be had. This is where we're at today. And I think that, you know, putting myself in this position, I run, have run the real risk of, and it is happening, people saying, what should I do next? How do I do that? What do you want? What should I? Here's my life story. And I think the same thing happens for people in business where the, everyone looks up to them. They want you to have all the answers. And when you don't have them, you feel like a fraud. But, you know, if you had all the answers, I would call you. So in general, as entrepreneurs and creatives, it seems like whenever someone asks us a question, we think we are meant to answer. Even if we don't have the answer, it seems like a normal response, especially if, like me, you grew up in India. Because in India, if you answer the question with the response, I don't know, the generic response back from my elders used to be, well, if you don't know, then who will? But what if you really don't have the answers when life throws a curveball like cancer? The gift of cancer. Survivor. That's funny. I've never been asked that question. I don't relate to that word. Survivor. I'm not going to give up. Survivors. You know what? I guess people survive stuff every day. I don't think it's that exemplary what I did. There's tons of people who have had more challenging episodes of all sorts of things. I mean, there's folks who uh, don't have food for their children. So, I don't know. I mean, um, Cancer, cancer is a slippery slope because there's people, when I talk about it, who have lost someone they love to cancer. Uh, so I never want to be flippant about it. Um, but the gift of cancer is, if you can imagine a moment, where you actually get to contemplate your funeral in a real way, like you have the power to plan it. And I have a playlist, and it's going to be called a funeral. And, and and you and you get to actually like really sit in this idea of like your children growing up without a mother. And look, it's easy for the dying person. That's that's a fast exit. Uh, for the people who survive you, that's a, a different thing. So, um, the way I see it is very selfishly as a person who had the cancer and all the good things I got from it. And, um, and I'm, I'm grateful that I guess I get to be a spokesperson for the people who live, but I, I can't believe how much of my life I spent pursuing things that didn't actually matter to me. And then that fine moment where you realize this is just a quick little ride on the marble, you get to go, man, how about I pursue some things that matter to me 
And forget about all this other stuff. The gift of cancer? What an insane way to flip the script. What makes us see this difference? There are people who are doing amazing things who have not been equalized. And there are people who have. And I believe that once you have, you can see the difference. And I think for anyone who's listening who's thinking, that doesn't apply to me, being selfish is great, it's got me great places, etc. I I would say just, just wait. You're going to get to feel that same amount of power and will and joy and, you know, great accomplishment, but you're going to get to feel it coupled with an equal measure of humility. And, and I think that's when selfishness gets to be tremendously useful. Hey, Kelsey, even though you are telling me all this stuff and even though you have beaten cancer and are so upbeat about living, I still feel like you have all your shit together. Do you have any weaknesses that you know of at least? So when I'm when I when my ego gets big, that's my that's my core weakness. Ego. If I had to get like right down granular style on it. I think my core weakness is probably uh, acceptance. So I think that if, if ever there is a moment where someone says to me, you could be liked more, I think I will do that. You know, you could have more notoriety. People could value you more. People could think you're better. That, that is bizarre to say, like, you know, um, but I think that's probably my core weakness. So if you play to that, you'll probably win me over. Uh <laughs> But I <laughs> uh, just put all my cards on the table. But where I'm going with that is that uh, when I was able to see my core weakness and release it and go, okay. Um, so when I have to come back to that moment, that cancer moment, that like I'm going to live moment, I pull up my NASA app on my phone. And I look at some picture of crazy intergalactic space and I imagine my ultimate insignificance. And it is the most freeing thing that I can give to myself because, uh, it just reminds me that if I'm going to make a choice, I should probably make it for my life uh, because if nothing matters, why would I bother living this shit with someone else? In Addendum 1, Kelsey speaks about pulling out the NASA app. She must really love that app. But here is what I'd like you to think about. What in your life can you flip the script on? What are you going through right now that is hurting? That is making you uncomfortable? What if you could see it differently? What if you didn't have to suffer? I'm going to leave you with a few lines from Kelsey's TEDx talk. So what happened in my life, and, and Ken Robinson speaks to this, is that I was judged by a system that didn't judge me well for what I'm good at. I'm not a scholar. I am not the smartest person there ever was. I don't fit into, you know, the stream. I did not well at school. I have some classmates here who can attest to the fact that I didn't do well. Um, I applied to 13 MBA schools and got into one. And the only reason I got into the one was, and I quote from the woman who let me in, I saw it sitting on the top of the no pile and it looked so different. I had to read it. And then I put it in the yes pile. And so what I'm talking about is something that we've all lost generally. The age advanced people in the audience may say that's our marbles which is true, that's exactly what we've lost, right? We've lost our marbles, we've lost our ability to play. And when I talk about play, I'm not talking about, you know, hitting a ball with a bat or whatever you think. I'm talking about, well, the definition of play is to engage in an activity for the enjoyment of it, not for any rightful purpose. And so that, in and of itself, is what we don't do anymore. If you think about your mind, it's, it's yourself, right? And when do you, as yourself, in a state of mental play, 
get a word in edgewise between your meeting at three o'clock and your conference call and I have to put the laundry away and whatever your story is. And so the play factor for all we adults who actually used to play, like we get it, we did it, is there, but it's buried. Psychology of entrepreneurship. I interviewed Kelsey because she has been named Canada's top female entrepreneurs for two years running. Author of the book, Success Hangover, Ignite Your Next Act, Screw Your Status Quo and Feel Alive. She has spoken around the globe at the likes of the Global Entrepreneurship Congress and the London School of Economics, has served as a mentor at the Richard Branson Center of Entrepreneurship. She has founded Talis Ridge Development, uh, a residential project management company in British Columbia, as well as Sparkplay, a uh, children's monthly subscription service based in London, Ontario. Recognized globally for building multiple multi-billion dollar businesses, both offline and online. She's a mother, a wife, and a friend. Psychology of Entrepreneurship This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Jay Gallison. Voiceover by Sonia Stone. Fact voiceover by Kaylee Bunnyman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivaz. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm a part of the team that made this production come alive. Our team consists of members from all around the globe with our headquarters based in West End, Brisbane, Australia, the land of the drop bear. For more about the cool stuff that we're up to and to work out of our studios, head to mustamplify.com. You still listening? Thanks for sticking around. Here's a little gift for you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is take two. In case uh, it's not on the record, Jake fucked up. As much as I knew the answer, I didn't like practice. On the right side... On the right hand side of the page in on the right hand side in the middle of the page, I would I would love to hear.